Good morning, Kevin Rabbit, on another shrimp story. I want to finish up with the 90s. Uh, this is a kind of troublesome time for me right now. When uh, I think it was uh, 1989, when I was on the Gulf King uh, 18, I I, uh, I got in trouble with the law. I got busted again. It was my second bust. The first, the first one I had was on uh, 1982 when I was on the Uncle Buddy, and uh, and then in uh, 1989, I, 88, no 87. How did that happen? Yeah, I think it was 87 when I got busted the second time, and uh, the thing was that uh, they had sentenced me. To uh, two two six-year uh, sentences because the first one was a ten-year sentence and then the second one they gave me a, a six-year sentence so they ran them cons consecutive but the thing is that I uh, I appealed it I appealed it for a year and a half and that year and a half is the time that I took a boat from uh, Norwood Jackson, Jackson Seafoods. I'm thinking it's the Roxy J. The Roxy J or the Irene J. No, it was the, the Roxy J. We took them to uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. We had to take the boats uh, to Cape Canaveral. They were going to go uh, kind of close galloping uh, at Norwood, Norwood boats. There was three of us. I think it was uh, Baba Reina took one of them, and I'm not sure who the other guy was, but I know it was old uh, Bimbo Reina that was with me on that boat, taking it across the Gulf of Mexico. You know, you take it straight across and go up to uh, Key West, Florida, then you go around the, e the end of Florida and come up in front of uh, Miami, and you keep going the East Coast. But at that time when we were, but uh, what was going on that I was scared the whole time over there. It took us uh, six days of running to get over there to uh, Key West, Florida, in front of Florida Inn over there where you got to go around. And uh, that boat right there had, was making a lot of water, man. It, it was me and Bimbo Reina that were on that boat. And we have to keep it constant eye on that boat. Pretty much every hour on the hour to every hour and a half, we have to be pumping that boat, turning the pump on, turning the pump on. Uh, I mean, every, all the every hour on the hour, you couldn't fucking uh, go to sleep or forget about it because that sucker will fill up with water, man. And we were out in the middle of the Gulf running across and... Uh, Man, it was it, it was shaky, scary, and uh, it doesn't let you sleep in peace or nothing like that because that boat was making a lot of water. But we wanted to get over there, and uh, anyway, when we were coming across and uh, we were getting in front of uh, Miami, there was a uh, two helicopters and then two Coast Guard cutters <laughs> come around. And they come right up beside your built your boat. The helicopters are up on top, two of them, in little short helicopters. But uh, I guess they were Coast Guard or military or something. But uh, they start calling you on the radio, and you gotta identify yourself. And who's all the uh, crew members on the boat? You gotta give them your address and everything. Who's the owner of the company? Where are we going? And all this kind of stuff. And uh, they finally cleared us and let us keep going. Well, we finally made it to Cape Canaveral with that boat, the Roxy J, and that thing we were pumping it constantly every hour on the hour, an hour and a half, had to be constantly pumping that thing. Well, we finally got to Cape Canaveral, and when we got to the dock, oh, uh, Marble Jackson was there, and uh, he was glad to see the boats. And uh, he invited us to a, a beer joint there was down the, down the block there, uh, down the dock there from uh, 
in Cape Canaveral there's a, I think it's a beer joint named uh, uh, the Lamp Post I believe and uh, anyway we went over there and we had a few beers and all that and I was that in Norbo that boat is making a lot of water man we have to be pumping it every hour and I uh, don't worry about it and sure enough we had about two or three beers when we went back to the boat and that boat was sunk <laughs> <laughs> it went down, and uh, so they started pumping it out. By the next day, they had it out, and uh, they uh, got the boat ready, and they towed it over there to uh, Lake Jackson, Florida, to haul it out. And when they did haul it out, there was a plank missing off of the, the boat. Uh, you know, there was a wooden hauls. And those wooden halls, they're built double walls, you know, you got an outside wall and you got an inside wall. Well, one of the outside wall boards had popped out, and that's why that boat was making so much water. So I guess the good Lord uh, was protecting me that whole trip, bringing that boat over here. Because that could have, boat could have gone down any time there, man. But anyway, uh, that bit, that's story on this one when I went to Florida like that I think it was uh, my compadre Mario Garcia he the one that drove my truck but that was the time that I had a, a brand new uh, Ford large uh, big truck a big three-quarter ton long bed anyway standard and uh, Mario Garcia drove it to Cape Canaveral Florida took the truck for me over there so I had an automobile, but I didn't stick. Uh, I didn't stick around uh, working on that boat. I think we only made a couple of trips or something like that. And there was a friend of mine, uh, who, uh, Tony Bonanio, was there, and I, and I asked him, "Hey, you want to go to Virginia? Let's go scalloping." And he said, "Yeah, let's go, man." So we got our our clothes and stuff off the boat and uh, and started driving, man. And uh, we went to Virginia, and uh, the first day I got to Virginia, as soon as I started uh, renting a room and stuff there, uh, oh, uh, Tim Benavides called me and asked me that uh, if I wanted to run a boat because there was a, they were needing a captain over there, Billy Wells, so, so uh, Seaford, Virginia. And said, yeah, I'll take it, man. So I went over there and I met uh, Billy Wells and... Uh, I got the boat, but I can't remember what was the name of that boat. It was one of the wooden halls there. Uh, it was a nice boat, man, and uh, those big old uh, wooden halls there built for, for the East Coast there. Uh, but uh, uh, the thing was that uh, I was having problems. Something happened with that engine. Uh, something about it got hot on me or something like that, and I had to return it. I had to take it back to the dock, and then uh, something was going on, and I was uh, having uh, crew problems. I couldn't find uh, uh, experience crew. I was there was just a bunch of greenhorns coming around looking for work, and the uh, boss didn't want me to be hiring uh, greenhorns. So. It, I was on the boat there a couple of times, and uh, I finally got to make a trip or something like that. And then, uh, but we didn't do very much. And uh, when we came back in, everybody got off the boat. I don't know what's going on. Tell what's going on with the price of how they were uh, dealing with the crew, you know, paying the crew. And then I couldn't find a damn crew uh, to go on the second trip. So, man, what the hell, man? So. Uh, Billy was uh, complaining at me, so I quit, and I went uh, to Newport News, Virginia. I went over there, and I started looking around, and that's when I met old uh, Fulton Fulcher. Uh, it's an old man that had a company there, had a few boats, and uh, he was needing a captain. And uh, so I talked to him, and it turned out that uh, a guy here from Aransas, old Edward Weeks, was working for him. So he's the one that uh, put in the work for him with him, so they gave me the boat. I think it was the Jennifer Lynn. 
uh, Jennifer Lynn. But at, right there on that area, in, in that place where we're at, Newport, New Virginia, where the fish house was at, there was a bunch of those Spanish boys standing around looking for work. And those were those experienced guys, good guys for cutting ca uh, cutting scallops. You know those scallop, uh, those crew guys, they got to be fast at cutting scallop, man, because uh, that's a lot of damn scallop and you've got to make sure it's going to get done, you know. And those, that's where those guys take pride of doing, being good at it. Of uh, knowing how to uh, cut scallop, you know, open, you know. Uh, but anyway, so I had a, a boat and a crew, and Edward called me when we we're getting ready, uh, getting that boat ready to go out. And uh, Edward called me and telling me that they were doing real good off the Georgia banks. Now that's off of Massachusetts, off of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, what is it? We, we went to the, uh, Boston, and uh, yeah, we, we I went in. But anyway, uh, so that's where we went. When I went out, I came out of Newport News, uh, Virginia, and went offshore. We ran three days east. Three days of running. Uh, you have to run across all through uh, New Jersey, New York, and all that until you finally got to Massachusetts. And uh, when we got there, off the Georgia banks, we were out, I would say, about 70, no, 38 fathoms of water, almost 40 fathoms. It was about 38 fathoms where we were at. And we were right on the Canada borderline uh, where we were at, man. And the first tow that we made, we were I was towing 11-foot dredges. You know, they go bigger, those, you can have up to 18 footers, but I had 11 footers. And uh, first tow, man, made a 30 minute tow. <laughs> that thing came up, man, and uh, they were over filling. They were over full. They were coming out the top. The, the dredge was so damn full, picking it up of a fucking scallop. Nothing but clean corn scallop, man, nice. Scallop, man, God, I don't know how many baskets <laughs> we had on that thing. It was over pretty close to fucking uh, 70, 80 baskets on that just one tow there, man. And, and uh, but we started loading up that boat. We, uh, what you do when you get in a lot of scallop like that, you just uh, pile it up and, and pile it up all around the boat where you can. And then later on, you can stop the boat and start cutting, you know. But uh, so we were on the process of, of, of loading up. We we're going to load up where I can stop the boat and start cutting for a few hours. And uh, I'd say we've been working about six hours, and the boat was full, man. I mean, from the anchor, both rails all the way back to the winch, then up on inside the jet, the ice hole. We put about 300, 400 baskets in there and then made another three, 400 baskets in the back deck. And uh, just then, the engine blew a damn uh, piston on the side of the block. <laughs> I mean, it just, boom, that sucker was dead. <laughs> dead in the water. <laughs> and the uh, dredges were down, man, that we were dragging when that happened. So uh, I called Edward. And uh, he, he's the one that uh, helped me pick up the, those dredges. We only picked up one side, and the other one broke the damn cable. Uh, so we lost one dredge. But anyway, he started towing me in. New Bedford, Massachusetts is where we went in at. But he's the one who started me uh, towing me in, and man, he had a rotten ass damn anchor line on there. What I did on the off of that boat and that anchor line keep breaking, man. As we were towing, and we had to stop and pick up that rope and uh, re retie it again and keep going, and then again, and again. I think it happened about three, four times that it broke that damn uh, rope before we got to the dock. So when we first got to uh, get into the jetties. Uh, I told uh, the crew, man, we're going to have to go downstairs because the engine was dead. 
we're gonna have to go downstairs and, and turn the, the belt to the to the winch you know the wet the belt down there on, on the PTO and just spin it and, you know get the crew start pulling it and just start spinning it one way and that's what we did we started putting the turn what so the winch was turning and we uh, picked up one outrigger one uh, one cat head at a time and that's how we picked up the outriggers had the, the crew downstairs spinning the damn belt on it <laughs> But we made it, man, and finally got to the dock. And New Bedford, Massachusetts, I ain't never been there in my life. It was the first time I ever come in. It was a big old dock, man. New Bedford, Massachusetts, it's a big old dock. And you talk about some big boats. <laughs> and you talk, uh, I'm talking about scallop boats. Uh, I don't know if they had any shrimpers, but they got all kind of uh, long lining and that kind of stuff, uh, lobstering. So there's a lot of different kind of things they do over there in New Bedford. But anyway, we got in there by, the, I'd say, about 1 o'clock at night. And, man, I was dog tired. But the thing is, by the time we hit the dock, those guys had already cut all that scallop. And I think we totaled 165 bags on the six-hour work period, and uh, which was damn good, man. <laughs> And uh, but something happened that morning. Uh, uh, I'd say by maybe six thirty, five, uh, seven o'clock in the morning, I was up, and I always first thing I do is put the pot of coffee on and and start drinking some coffee in the morning, and that's where I was at in the wheelhouse uh, drinking some coffee, my first cup of coffee in the morning when all of a sudden one of my my crew members came to the boat and he was the only uh, color guy with me on my crew all the rest were Spanish boys and this guy he had already worked with me on the other boat that we were working for with uh, Billy Wells he had already made two trips with me so we uh, knew each other I mean we talked to each other as good friends man treated each other right so that morning he comes up to to me on the wheelhouse and telling me, hey man, I want my money. I need my money. And uh, I started looking at him and I could see that his, his eyes were kind of dilated and he was kind of messed up and screwed, uh, uh, you know, high. And uh, I said, hey, wait a minute. No, I ain't, I ain't got no money. I'm still waiting on the boss man to bring the advance. That's why I'm still on the boat. He said, nah, you're lying to me. You got my money. You're holding my money. And this guy just came up to me and started swinging at me. He hit me. And I said, God damn. So I started blocking him. And uh, the thing is that at that time I used to carry a knife on my belt, a six blade, a six inch blade. And this guy started swinging at me, man. Before I knew it, man, I had that damn blade in my hand, man. And I started. Uh, messing that guy up, man. Fucking blood coming out uh, everywhere, all the way around. This guy, he fucking finally snapped where I was stabbing him and uh, and seen the blood coming out of him and he turned around started running out the damn wheelhouse door and I followed him. My damn, my mind had already jumped where fucking I was going to kill this guy. I don't know. I, I was chasing him. And so I chased him around the goddamn cabin when he came out of the wheelhouse, went around, all the way around the cabin, came back in the galley, and I was still behind him, man, stabbing this guy, man. And finally, it fucking, it, it dawned on me, and I felt my blood go down to me, to my feet, and I said, what the hell am I doing? I'm killing this guy. And, uh... And this guy was messed up, but he got off the boat. He, he was able to, there were two boats to the dock tied up, uh, and he jumped off the boat and jumped off the other boat and landed at the dock. But those people, the people on the dock had already seen him calling the ambulance on him, calling the ambulance. And so uh, I dropped that damn knife in the, in the, in the water there and... Uh, you know, where we were tied up, there was 
two boats, right? And right a, across the side of the, the, the harbor where we were tied up, there was a big old Coast Guard cutter tied up right there. But I guess when it happened, it was right at, uh, at noon. There was nobody around, man. Nobody had seen nothing. And, uh, but anyway, I walked off. I started walking off, and I went and uh, uh, walked to a store and called a taxi. I had a, a little bit of money. I guess I got about 60, 70 bucks in my pocket. And, uh, so I went to a motel, and I rented a room. And when I got in the room, I had just start, called uh, Irene because I had been away from home for about going on the sixth month or the seventh month. When I took that boat to uh, Florida to Cape Canaveral, then from Cape Canaveral, that I made two trips on Billy Will's boat, and then I was on my third trip over here. But anyway, uh, when that happened, and then sure enough, they were knocking on my door, and I went and opened it. There were the cops. And you're the captain of that boat, and all this, and yes, it is. And you just stabbed that man. Well, he attacked me. He came at me, man. And uh, and he said, well, why did you leave? Well, hell, look at me, man. I was all shaky, and <laughs> uh, the end of my world, man. But anyway, golly, something like that happens in a lose your control, I mean, God, he, uh, but uh, that was the, the, why this story was, uh, and, and we're talking about 1989 and, and uh, it was 1990 when all of this happened that I, and uh, I was locked up for three weeks there in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, it was a big old uh, jailhouse there. I think it was almost 500 inmates. That was a big old place. And uh, all them people there were a bunch of uh, San Domingo people. And, there's, and there was a neighborhood there in, in New Bedford, Massachusetts of them. And uh, they're the ones who were locked up at that area right there. So they helped me, man. I can't, when they locked me up, I still had my boots on. <laughs> <laughs> I still had my boots and all that, so those guys, they started uh, helping me with uh, shoes and uh, pants and uh, underwear and all that kind of shit. They, they, they straightened me out, man, helping. They were beside me, man, those three months, those three weeks that I was locked up. I thought uh, if that guy would have died on me, I, I was, I was uh, worried that I was going to face a, a fucking uh, murder charge on me. And there was one of them guys that took me to church, and uh, he took me to the Catholic Church, and uh, started telling me how to pray and ask God to be with you and all this. So that's what I did, man. And uh, sure enough, looking about uh, uh, three weeks later, they, they took me to the, see the judge, and the judge uh, put me on a, P, uh, on a uh, PR bond, man. Let me out. <laughs> He said, what? Okay. <laughs> so so I got out, and uh, I still had a little money for the taxi, so I called a taxi, and I went to the dock there in, in New Bedford, and uh, it was so uh, Timmy Rollis was one of his boats. Uh, he was running a big old boat, man. But the guy that was with me it was old Jimbo Lopez. He was my rig man on that boat when I, we, we went in. He was my rig man, Jimbo Lopez. He's from here, from Aransas. And... Uh, Anyway, when I got out and I went to the dock, he was there, and Jimbo was started had gotten a job with uh, with Timmy Rollis, so he hooked me up with Timmy, and they were two guys short, so they gave me the job, man. And uh, and, and Jimbo Lopez is uh, they uh, let me borrow a little money where I can go out and uh, learn the town, <laughs> New Bedford, Massachusetts, man. <laughs> But anyway, I went out with uh, with Jim, uh, uh, T Timmy, and we made two trips or three trips with him. And man, we were hitting. That guy was dragging eighteen foot dredges. <laughs> I mean, uh, you talk about an eighteen foot row of scallops, you'd be uh, filling up baskets. <laughs> 
So we were getting it on. Once you go on that boat, you start working there non-stop, man. You only get to sleep two or three hours out of the 24. The rest of the time is 18 and 19 hours on the back deck. <laughs> yeah, but that was back then uh, in the 90s, so I was still a little young guy. I could still do it, man. And uh, But anyway, I made two trips, and we did good in one trip, so I called Irene. And she flew over, and Renee was a little, I think Renee was about 10 years old, 11 years old. We went with Renee. They flew to uh, Providence, Providence, uh, Rhode Island. Yeah, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, I went and picked them up. It was a thing about it that I had my car. It was a friend of mine that was a, uh, one of Timmy Rowley's uh, deck hand, uh, rig man. He was a friend of ours from Corpus Christi. I used to know his dad and all that. They used to shrimp together. But anyway, he was working with Timmy Rollins, and his wife was in Virginia, and that's where my car was at. At that time, I had a Camaro, and uh, she drove the Camaro to uh, New, Be New Bedford, Massachusetts. So I had my car over there. So uh, when Irene flew over, I was able to go pick her up at the airport and bring her bring her to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and uh, we, we hung up, we hang out a, a couple of more days because I was planning on uh, going, making another trip on the boat, and, uh, but then I, we started talking about it, and we started thinking about it, and I said, no, the hell with it, let's go home, man, and I was driving, and I think it was a 69 Camaro that I had at that time, and that car, uh, we could only drive nighttime because you drive it, it was in the, pretty much in the middle of July when that happened. The heat was on, man, hot. <clears throat> so that car would get hot and you start driving in the daytime. So we uh, we would have got in the habit of driving at nighttime and renting a room at daytime. Go to sleep in daytime and, and, and drive at nighttime. And so that's the way we got home. And I think it was in uh, 1990 when I got home. When I got home, a week later, they came knocking on my door. The cops were already looking for me. My uh, appeal had already come up, so it was time for me to go. So sure enough, they locked my ass up. It was in one week, I was in diagnostics, Huntsville. <laughs> But that first time, uh, I only did six months. And, and Jester won there in Sugar Land there in, in, uh, beside Houston. For six months, uh, I had an experience uh, there that had me in, uh, I think it was the warehouse, and doing things around the warehouse, and then they put me out working uh, swine squad, <laughs> the pigs, <laughs> pushing all the crap out of there. <laughs> but anyway, I got in a fight with some guy there, so they moved me out of there, and they put me on the fin squad, going out fixing fences around the, the pastures they had all over TDC there in Texas. But anyway, <clears throat> at that time I started studying uh, in school. And I got my, and they just give you booklets, and you're reading booklets, and it kind of upgrade on what you left behind when you were going to school. So I studied it, and uh, within uh, maybe three weeks or four weeks, something like that, I took a test, and I passed it, man. I got my GED <laughs> the first time there, and just the one, 19, 1990. Anyway, but I came out in 91, I believe, is when I came out of 90, uh, at just the one. But the thing is, when I was there, in just the one in the penitentiary, I had some guys, some lawyers, come to see me in the penitentiary. And these lawyers were from the company that I was running, working for, when that guy got hurt, that I hurt that guy on the boat. It happened on the boat. That was the, why I got lucky where the state of uh, Massachusetts 
didn't uh, pick up the charges on me when I stabbed that guy uh, because he was on a boat. He was maritime law. And I tried to cover my ass, man, because uh, and sure enough, they, uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't pursue it, you know, where the state itself was supposed to have picked it up, and they didn't. But I guess the guy that got hurt, he never filed a complaint on me. And that was the lucky part about it. But anyway, these uh, lawyers wanted me to uh, write a, a deficit and explaining what happened, what happened that day. And I told him, no, I'm very upset with that company, man. That guy's, when all that happened, that I was locked up, I tried to get a hold of the boss, man, and they wouldn't even answer the damn calls on me. And uh, I had a check coming of the 165 uh, bags, and they didn't pay me. They took the boat, all my belongings on that boat, everything and they never wanted to answer the call man so no i'm not gonna do nothing for them and if they want something from me they're gonna have to pay me what they owe me and that's where i left it at and then uh a few more uh, a couple of mo months later i came out and i came home you know and uh, it was only a six month uh, period that i did the first time I believe I came out in 91, and uh, I'd say about a month or so later, after I was home, I received a letter. I, re I received a letter from the company, and it had a, a check in there. They sent me $5,000. So they scheduled, they scheduled for me to come to Rockport for me to write a, make a deficit make a video of what ex explaining what went on that day so that's what we did and uh, okay anyway but I say that man I got real lucky that uh, the good Lord was taking care of me I lost my control and all that on, on a guy like that now I always respect the guys that work for me uh, a working man is a working man and, and they deserve their uh, their respect, and that's what I am. I like to people to respect who I am and who are the ones that work with me. And I always try to treat a man right, man. And uh, but anyway, that day I just lost it, and so I don't know that kind of shit happens. And that's why I wanted to uh, to uh, put the story. So now it's, that's going to jump me to 1991 already when I came out. Uh, uh, the penitentiary just the one, it's the first time. And uh, in 91, yeah, you know what we did? Jackson Seafood got sold. I remember that. We delivered Jackson Seafood. I think it was seven boats or eight of them. It got delivered to Mexico, to La Ciudad de Carmen. It's over there in. Uh, uh, Cancun, close to Cancun, right beside it, uh, and there's a, there's an island there, they call it the La Ciudad de Carmel, uh, it's an island, but it's a shrimping company there, uh, Spanish people there own it, and uh, they bought those boats, so they're all over there, and there's what used to be Jackson Seafoods, we delivered that boat. All right, I'm going to make another one for what happened after that because uh, my addiction was still bothering me and messing me up, but uh, I'll make another one, so good morning to you.